discover Scotland's forgotten history. Welcome to Scotland's Forgotten History. Let's continue to consider the life of John Carstairs, a remarkable minister, though the story of his life is not often told. When he was first called to be the minister of Cathcart near Glasgow in 1647, an old minister said to a gentleman there, Call this young man, for he is a man of many meditations. He was not without opposition sometimes in that parish. On one occasion it was necessary to pronounce excommunication against one man who threw a stone at Carstairs in the pulpit, which he very narrowly escaped. He loved his congregation there and did not want to leave, but submitted to the desires of others for him to go to Glasgow. It broke his heart though, as he himself said, he never got over it. One man said he thought he should have killed himself with weeping. He never hardly saw any man weep so much as Mr Carstairs did when he was transported to Glasgow. He was chaplain at the Battle of Dunbar in 1650, where the Scottish army was defeated by Cromwell. Carstairs was wounded and taken for dead amongst the rest. He lay for some time amongst the dead, and a soldier came to strip the dead bodies to get what could be useful to them. And he came to him and set his foot upon him near his groin. Carstairs said he never bore a greater stress than that. If he stirred, he would have been slain immediately. After some time, a poor woman came to him and inquired if he wanted anything from her. He said to her, if you could give me a napkin, I would desire it, for he was weeping sore. He also inquired if she saw Mr. James Guthrie ride by her, for he was much concerned about his safety. Well, Carstairs survived and was very useful in his ministry in Glasgow alongside James Durham. They were well suited together. It was said of Carstairs, he was a man of great and rare piety. He was full of love. He dwelt, walked and lived in that fire of love. The morning before the Marquis of Argyll was executed, Carstairs prayed earnestly with Campbell's wife at a house in the Canning Gate. Some of the words he prayed, some be of good cheer, came directly to the mind of the Marquis with much assurance at the very same time when he was in the Tolbooth prison further up the Royal Mile near St Giles. During the restoration, Carstairs had to go into exile and into hiding during the times in which he was outlawed, but he was able to end his days in Edinburgh. He did not author books himself, but rather edited many of James Durham's books, and the long prefaces he wrote are worthwhile reading in themselves showing him to be a man of many meditations. John Leslie, the first Duke of Rothes, was one of the prime figures in the persecuting government of the time and led it in the early 1660s before being made Lord Chancellor for life. His wife, like his father, was a devout Presbyterian who would regularly attend field preaching meetings and often invited Covenanters to stay at Leslie House as her guests. The Duke was not unaware of this and tolerated. And when Leslie was dying in Holyrood House in 1681, he called for a Presbyterian minister to pray for him, not one of the Episcopalian men. So his wife summoned Carstairs, who was infirm and had to be carried in. Many nobles were there who we are told were very graceless, but they were all deeply affected and amazed by the prayer and brought to weeping. One woman who was a great enemy of the Covenanters went out of the room but still heard the prayer next door. She said she never knew the difference before so clearly between a prelatic and Presbyterian minister as now I perceive when I hear this man's prayer. William Douglas, the Duke of Hamilton, said to some of the nobles that were with him, This is a strange thing. We are I hunting and pursuing these men in the time of our life and health, but we are, many of us, made to call for them at our death. The Duke also said, I never heard such a prayer as this. Carstairs had around five years before he would depart from this life in February 1686 at the age of 63 years. His final testimony 
reveals him to be a man of many meditations in death. I bless God this day that I know in whom I have believed, to whom I have committed my soul as unto a faithful keeper, that I know I am going to my God, who is the portion and chief joy of my soul. My soul blesseth God and rejoiceth in him, that death cannot separate betwixt me and my God. I leave my wife and children upon the compassionate and merciful heart of my God, having many reiterated assurances that God will be my God and the God and portion of mine. I bless and adore my God that death for a long time hath been no terror to me, but rather much desired and that my blessed Jesus hath taken this thing out of death and made the grave a bed of rest to all that have laid hold on him by faith, which worketh by love. My soul bleeds for the deplorable condition of the Church of Scotland. We are losing the gospel, having fallen from our first love and zeal. And therefore God is threatening to spew us out of his mouth. Oh, that my blood could contribute in the least to enable this remnant to do their first works, and might contribute in the least to establish any of his in the ways of holiness and righteousness. I have had sharp sufferings for a considerable time, and yet I must say to the commendation of the grace of God, my suffering time has been the best time, and when my suffering has been sharpest, my spiritual joys and consolations have been greatest. Let none be afraid of the cross of Christ, his cross is our greatest glory. All that love God in sincerity prepare for the hardest sufferings, for fire and gibbets. He goes on to speak about how many who profess the name of Christ are averse to suffer for him, and he fears that Christ and his members may be buried for a while in the nation. Yet I have good ground of hope to believe that the Son of Righteousness will again shine with healing under his wings. O oh, that God would awake his remnant while it is the day, that they may consider what belongs to their peace. Will be to them that are instrumental to banish Christ out of the land. And blessed are they who are instrumental by a gospel conversation or life, and a continual wrestling with God to keep Christ in the nation. He is the glory of a land, and if we could but believe him, he could not part with us. Woe be to them that would rather banish Christ out of the land than love him. God pour out his spirit plenteously upon the poor remnant, that they may give God no rest till he make his Jerusalem the joy and praise of the whole earth. I go with joy to him who is the joy and bridegroom of my soul, to him who is the saviour and redeemer of my soul. I go with rejoicing to the God of my life, to my portion and inheritance, to the husband of my soul. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. So ended the prayers and meditations of John Carstairs. One of the expressions he sometimes used in prayer was, Oh, that we may never outlive our integrity, nor die undesired. That's a meditation worth pondering for you and I. I'm Matthew Vogan. Thank you for listening to Scotland's Forgotten History. To dig deeper, visit scotlandsforgottenhistory.com.